I am not a fan of Ryan Murphy, but I was convinced to watch one episode of the show Feud a while back because they were talking about Joan Crawford's role in a film called Straight Jacket. And promoting the movie was John Waters, playing the part of Hollywood producer William Castle. I'm William Castle, the director of the picture you're about to see. Be warned, Straight Jacket contains the most realistic portrayal of axe murders in motion picture history. And the next day, my Facebook feed was flooded with articles and posts that all asked the same thing. Who the hell is William Castle? If you want it short, here's how I would describe him. He was probably the craziest person Hollywood has ever employed. This, of course, is London. And I am William Castle. Oh, it's good to see you again, my homicidal friends. Castle is responsible for a few horror favorites, a fair amount of bombs, and one surprising classic of the silver screen. But even with his pictures aside, the one thing that Castle is remembered for most is the spectacle he introduced to horror films in a way that hadn't really been seen before. And I feel sure that when you leave this theater, you too will believe in ghosts. Uh, no more dictation today. And after I first read an article about Castle a couple years ago, I wanted to know absolutely everything about him. So I went to the library. I picked up every book that I could get my hands on about him, including his memoirs. I watched documentary after documentary. And I can honestly say, the more I find out about William Castle's life, the more amazing his life becomes. He is without a doubt one of the most fascinating, entertaining people I think has ever lived, which is why for the last day of the 13 days of Halloween this year, I wanted to showcase the work and the life of a man who is constantly referred to as the ultimate showman of Hollywood. So this is my tribute to the cigar smoking, gimmick innovating, trailblazing, pulse raising, scream staging, attention grabbing phenomenon known as William Castle. Welcome to my nightmare. William Henry Schloss was born in New York in 1914. He hated that name. He always thought it sounded like schlup or slush or something else that made his name sound worthless. So he found out that when you translate it to German, Schloss means castle. And that's where we get the name. Castle dropped out of high school and got his start in theater working for Bela Lugosi's Dracula. He would work on and off the stage in theaters across New York until Orson Welles, of all people, loaned him a space at Stony Creek Theater. His first production was a German play called Das ist nicht für Kinder, or This is Not for Children. The German star of the play, Ellen Schwanecke, was sent an invitation by Joseph Goebbels to return to Nazi-occupied Germany for a film festival that Hitler would be attending. Uh, Schwanecke had actually left Germany for America after seeing Hitler's rise to power and had no family in the country. She was in a huge bind and she came to Castle for help in this situation. And this is where we're going to see the beginning of a pattern. Because William Castle never saw an opportunity for a publicity stunt that he did not take. Castle took it upon himself to send a cable to Hitler himself, saying that Schwanecke was declining the invitation, stating very clearly she would not return to Germany while he was still in power, and just as an extra punctuation, he added a PS on the bottom that stated, she's working for me now. That reply was reprinted in newspapers all over New York with titles like The Girl Who Said No to Hitler and German Actress Snubs the Fuhrer. And the play got all the press and publicity that it needed to be a success. And someone in the audience of the play worked for Columbia Pictures, which led to Castle getting offered a deal to direct a couple of pictures for them. For his directorial debut, he was put in charge of a picture called Chance of a Lifetime, which... It's kind of ironic when you think about it. Anyway, long story short, the script was awful, the acting was lame, and the review said that it was the worst directed film in cinema history. And there was reason to believe that because Ed Wood hadn't come out with his first pictures yet. Pull the string! Pull the string! He'd eventually move on to movies that were a lot more well-received, like The Whistler, along with its three sequels, and he did a few films with Universal before he decided to leave the big studios and break out as an independent producer. And he decided to settle on horror after seeing the film Diabolique. Now, Diabolique is an incredible movie, especially for its time, and it's influenced everyone from Castle to Vincent Price to Alfred Hitchcock. 
And in Castle's case, it got him to look through all sorts of novels and scripts to find something that could scare the crap out of people in a similar fashion. And he found it when he came across the novelization for The Marble Forest. So he mortgaged his home, bought the rights outright for the production, and got to work on a movie called Macabre. Macabre is a very creepy story involving a girl who's been kidnapped and locked in a coffin while the girl's parents have only four hours to find her before she suffocates. Castle even cut the time of how long the girl would have to live and trimmed her age by a year or two from the novel to build up suspense. And for a first outing, Macabre isn't half bad. It's got some creative and creepy atmosphere for such a small budget film, and although it's more mystery than horror, there were still some genuinely good frights. But Castle was afraid that it wasn't gonna be good enough to stand on its own, so hearkening back to his days as a theater producer, he came up with an idea that would drive up audiences whether the film was good or not. Lloyd's of London was a company that was notorious for claiming to ensure anything, no matter how ridiculous. So Castle had them put up $1,000 for each person who bought a ticket for Macabre and they would pay it if they died of fright from what they saw on screen. Every single member of the audience got a ticket that said that if I died, William Castle would say, my bad, and give me $1,000. Castle even showed up to the premiere of Macabre by climbing out of a coffin, and he hired fake nurses and ambulances to stand by and treat people in case they actually needed to take out their policy. I really need to stress that the movie itself was good. Most of Castle's movies were not classics, but they were still okay. But the gimmick here helped propel Macabre's ticket sales to over $5 million in the U.S. alone. And due to some stiff negotiating between distributors, Castle kept 75% of the profits. Castle would use every cent of that money to fund his future projects. So he had a new strategy from this day forth. Every film he would direct and produce, there would be a gimmick. Now, Castle was far from the first person to use gimmicks with his films. 3D had become increasingly popular by the early 1950s. Movies like Fantasia specifically upgraded theaters to have perfected sound for their scores. And as early as 1927, there was even a type of film produced called Polyvision, which used three screens running at the same time for one movie. But the one thing that made Castle's films just a little bit more noteworthy was that each gimmick was introduced for specific movies and couldn't be worked for anything else. There's not enough space on the internet for a video detailing every single movie he's made or gimmick that he went along with, so we'll stick to the more noteworthy ones, and it continues with one you may have actually heard of. The ghosts are waiting, so won't you join me in the house on Haunted Hill? Hooray. Or you'll be late for your own funeral. House on Haunted Hill is one of those movies that probably shouldn't be as good as it is. It tells the story of a group of people invited to a house for a simple game. Spend the night with Vincent Price in a haunted house and you win $10,000. I know people who would pay $10,000 just to have a conversation with Vincent Price. From a simple glance, it looks like a corny, cheesy, downright stupid in some instances movie. But Tom Savini has said on multiple occasions that certain scenes in this film scared him a lot, including this old woman. How is it possible that the special effects genius Tom Savini is frightened by an elderly woman on a skateboard? But there is one famous scene in the movie that's responsible for the next gimmick. She was supposed to stay down, but the bones came up. Some of them would have names. This gimmick was called Emerjo. Theaters across the country would rig elaborate pulley systems over the audience so that when the skeleton emerges from a pit of acid, an actual skeleton would fly over the crowd, kind of like the Phantom of the Opera's chandelier, only it's a cheesy prop skeleton. It never really went anywhere, and the most lasting effect of the skeleton was that the kids would try to knock it down with soda cups and popcorn bags. It's a pity you didn't know when you started your game of murder that I was playing too. But that's not to say that this would be the only success that he would have with Vincent Price in that exact year. The Tingler could only be made by somebody like William Castle. The Tingler is about a creature that grows inside people's bodies and attaches itself to their spinal columns when they're frightened. But the creature has a weakness. It can be defeated by screaming. This movie bleeds 
1960s schlock horror. The acting is hokey, the effects are laughable, and the main villain looks basically like a declawed lobster. It also features one of my favorite scenes in any movie ever. Vincent Price pretending to be on LSD. The room is closing in on me. You gotta make it stop. The walls. The walls. So what makes the tingler noteworthy or by some stretch good? Aside from the fact that it's the first mainstream horror movie to show a character dropping acid, <laughs> it would also introduce the world to a new gimmick called Percepto. Some of the physical reactions which the actors on the screen will feel will also be experienced for the first time in motion picture history by certain members of this audience. There's a scene in The Tingler where the creature actually gets loose in a movie theater and cuts into the projection, causing the screen to go white. And that's when you hear Vincent Price yell out in horror. Please do not panic, but scream! Scream for your lives! The Tingler is loose in this theater, and if you don't scream, it may kill you! Now, in order to sell the idea that The Tingler was actually under people's seats, Castle had them outfitted with motorized buzzers that would shock audience members at random. At any time you are conscious of a tingling sensation, you may obtain immediate relief by screaming. At this point, it didn't matter what the film reviews were saying, which for the record were pretty bad. The experience alone made it worth the admission. In his memoirs, Castle claimed that he shocked as many as 20 million asses, because only a man like William Castle would say that statistic out loud and probably be accurate about it. William Castle, the producer of this motion picture, has a question for you. Do you believe in ghosts? 13 Ghosts was his next film, and it's the first one that he actually made with the gimmick already in his mind before filming started. Usually they'd come up with them later in the promotion of the film, but this one was different, because the film centers around a family that moves into the house of a recently deceased relative, and the relative had been working on a pair of goggles that allow people to see actual ghosts. <laughs> Now, as the title suggests, there are 13 ghosts in this, so some theaters gave out scorecards you could cross off which ghosts you've actually seen. Uh, others decided to give out vomit bags in case people were too shocked into sickness, because at this point, the theaters themselves were trying to up the ante on Castle and outdo his gimmick. So Castle said, screw all of you, I give you Illusiono. You were given a special ghost viewer like this. And here's how it works. Would you please change the color of the screen? Thank you. Like in the movie itself, ghost viewers were given out to the audience, and you could actually look through the two different sides, one of which would show the ghosts on screen, and the other would hide them from view. And it was also hinted that every time a character puts on their ghost viewer, you were meant to do the same. And remember, if you believe in ghosts, look through the red part. If you don't believe in ghosts, look through the blue. It's a pretty good idea, but in reality, the movie was only shot one way, so no matter how you looked at the screen, you could probably still see what you were always meant to. Which is probably for the best, because the only time you'd look through was when you wanted to see ghosts on screen, and if you didn't, why did you pay to see a movie called 13 Ghosts? Take the supernatural viewer home with you, and tonight, when you're alone, and your room is in darkness, look through the red part of the viewer. If you dare. Castle was always really proud of his gimmicks. He never used them as a throwaway gag. He always bought into them. And before a lot of his movies, he'd go into detail on why his material was better than the others on the sole grounds that it's something new and refreshing. So I guess now is as good a time as ever to bring up a question you probably have, which is, wow, doesn't he sound a lot like Alfred Hitchcock? My name is Alfred Hitchcock, and I would like to tell you about my forthcoming lecture. Depending on which critic you ask, you may hear that when it all comes together, Castle was nothing more than a poor man's Alfred Hitchcock. But if you look at their work side by side, I can totally see where they're coming from. They had similar styles, themes, even plot points in some movies. But the two weren't rivals so much as competitive spirits. They never really lashed out at each other. Hitchcock even made some fairly nice comments about Castle's films like Macabre and House on Haunted Hill. 
And there are times in history where it was really hard to tell who was ripping off who. Hitchcock famously made his screenings of Psycho feel like high-end shock events by stating that nobody could enter the theater after it had already started, giving it sort of a theatrical presence. And while Castle never did anything like that, so to speak, he did pull off something pretty remarkable for Homicidal. The story of a lovable group of people who just happened to be homicidal. Homicidal is a pretty good slasher film centered around what the film constantly bills as the homicidal girl who terrorizes a small family in California. Homicidal is one of those movies that I think is overlooked a lot in the grand scheme of things because it was way too similar to a classic in the wrong ways. And it is very reminiscent of Psycho. It even throws in a twist at the end regarding the identity of the killer. But for the record, I think Homicidal's twist is much more entertaining and original than Psycho's was, and it involves a little bit more backtracking and analysis. But the film itself aside, it's probably known as Castle's greatest achievement for one simple thing, the fright break. When you go to see my picture, Homicidal, you'll get one of these certificates. Then at the climax of Homicidal, there will be a fright break. I've heard of a few films doing something similar to this, where they'd warn you outright that something horrifying was coming. There was a gimmick in the 60s called the horror horn, which would flash red and have this audible, obnoxious drone to let you know something terrifying was about to happen, just in case you were to turn away. But Homicidal did something a little bit more personal and humiliating. The only picture ever to offer a money-back guarantee for those too frightened to see its shocking climax. Now, the crowd, for the most part, would remain seated, but there was an option for you to leave before the climax and get your money back. But in order to do that, you had to walk a line bathed in yellow light and sit in a section for a couple of minutes called the Coward's Corner. If you are too frightened to stay to see the rest of the picture, you can present this certificate at the Coward's Corner and get your full admission price refunded. A record would play on loop screaming chicken at people in the corner and fake nurses would take a blood pressure test to make sure that you weren't too weak to walk out of the door. Then you would have to fill out a form that says clearly on the bottom, I am a bona fide coward. We made yellow streaks and footprints going through the uh, audience and a, a loudspeaker saying, these are yellow people. They're yellow <laughs> and they were frightened to go out to get their butt. And you did this in front of an audience that would make fun of you for doing it the entire time. So it shouldn't really be surprising that not a lot of people took him up on the offer. 1% of ticket sales were refunded. Then again, maybe it wasn't the gimmick of the coward's corner of the money back guarantee. Maybe it was just the threat from Castle himself. Don't reveal the ending of homicidal to your friends or they will kill you. If they don't, I will. William Castle just told you, if you spoil the ending of his movie, he will find you and kill you. And unlike Stephen King, who said something similar about The Mist, I believe that Castle will kill me from beyond the grave if I do. Uh, do you think it's fair to tell the ending of a picture like this to your friend? No. Why not? Well, it, yeah, well for one thing, if they're going to see it, it spoils it. And for another thing, let them pay their 70 cents and see it and find out for themselves. That trailer for Homicidal is amazing, and Castle himself is what sells it the best. He was constantly in a state of showmanship, and the trailers for his films are without a doubt one of my favorite aspects of his entire presentation. The ones where he would show up on screen and talk to the audience were definitely my favorite, and were often part of the movies themselves. They were almost like infomercials for the gimmick he was testing out, explaining the process and how some of them would work. Some of them wouldn't even include clips from the film itself. But the thing about these ads is you're not just glued to the screen because of the ideas that are presented, it's because in person, William Castle was delightful. Time to go downstairs now. Got a date to carve a corpse. He's so excited to show you what he's got in store every time he comes on screen. Smiling, chomping at that cigar, just camping it up like crazy. We have even a stranger tale to unfold. Oh, ah, blood. Seriously, after checking out these trailers, I kind of want to go to the movies just because it seems like I'd be doing a favor for a friend. Kind of like, well, I wasn't going to put on these silly glasses while I watched this movie about ghosts, but all right, Willie, anything for you. <laughs> 
Mr. Sardonicus is an interesting one to say the least. Uh, the movie centers around a man who dug up his father's grave because he supposedly had a winning lottery ticket in his pocket. Don't act like you haven't. And anyway, the powers that be decide he needs to be punished for this by disfiguring Sardonicus's face to try and match the ghoulish grin his father had in the crypt. God, look at that face. Apparently, the actor playing Sardonicus couldn't wear the makeup for more than an hour at a time, which is why he's always wearing a mask throughout the movie. But the face does make you feel something for Sardonicus, even as he commits horrible acts against his victims, which you'll need to take into account because you decide how this movie ends. Really? You do. After you see the evil events that made Mr. Sardonicus what he was, you will decide what should be done to him. Castle's idea for Mr. Sardonicus was something called the Punishment Pull. He handed out giant cards to the audience with the purpose being that at the end of the film, just before the climax, you could decide whether or not Sardonicus would be shown mercy or if he would be punished on screen. And this may be my favorite gimmick in Castle's entire career because of the presentation. But don't you agree with me that such a miserable scoundrel should be made to suffer and suffer and suffer? Three minutes before the film's end, Castle would appear on screen and pretend to count the votes by himself. Uh, that young couple on the left, is that one vote or two that you're casting? Two votes? Uh, thank you. It's brilliant. I could watch this all day. Subtract 40. <sighs> no mercy. So be it. Castle insisted there was a merciful ending that showed a handful of times, but... TCM looked for it, and they couldn't find a single print. It was most likely a lie on the part of Castle to drum up more publicity. But just think of the effort that would have taken to make this gimmick work in real time. They would have had to actually count up the audience's vote, play the right reel depicting Castle pretending to count the votes himself, and then play that reel with the correct ending that correlated to the vote. It would have been a pain in the ass just to do half of that. Which is probably why that's all they did. And Castle, I think, knew his audience well enough that the only film he had to shoot was the one where Sardonicus suffers. And the majority of you have sentenced Mr. Sardonicus to further punishment. Mr. Projectionist, let the sentence be carried out. Now, the people who financed Castle's films started to see the age of the gimmick fading, and they really pressured him to do a better job with his movie Straight Jacket. A story so full of unexpected thrills and shocks and suspense that the audience has no chance to catch its breath. The first star dropped out due to injury and Castle basically threw himself at Joan Crawford. The author of the famed novel Psycho, the director of the widely acclaimed chiller Homicidal, the co-star of Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. Now, for all intents and purposes, Straight Jacket isn't a bad film. It's fairly tense. It's got a few iconic shots. But when you compare it to Joan Crawford's other movies, maybe not so much. And I know this is well known, but barely worth mentioning. But Crawford was really great at playing a crazy person. It was an asylum and it was hell. 20 years of pure hell. Now, the episode of Feud that was based on this does kind of highlight how irritated Crawford was eventually to be working for somebody like Castle. They fought a lot backstage. Uh, when her co-stars were starstruck during line readings, Crawford demanded that they be replaced. Uh, Crawford thought that Castle was incredibly unprofessional because he was notorious for doing things day of and not having rehearsals. And Castle's daughter was actually given a role, but she was so terrified of what Joan Crawford looked like holding an ax, she had to be replaced too. But probably the biggest point of argument between the two of them would be during screenings of the film itself. Crawford would go out and carry an axe like she does in the movie and go a little nuts for the crowd, but Castle would go above and beyond and actually have a bunch of plastic axes made up and hand them out to people in the audience. What the hell is this? You said no more gimmicks. Well, do you want to hit Joan or don't you? I love that he had spent all this time working to not have a gimmick for this film, and at the end of it, he was just like, screw it, let me get some fake cardboard axes and pass them out. And I think it is important to note that not everybody was a fan of the gimmicks. Crawford wasn't in the minority here. Uh, only a couple of his gimmicks were absolute hits, but some of them were on the borderline of bad taste. Like, remember that German play that was produced before he started working on it? 
Rumor has it that he paid a bunch of kids to vandalize the ticket booth of the theater with swastikas and graffiti in order to drum up some sympathy. And when it came to promoting films themselves, he sometimes favored the gimmicks over the actors who actually worked on them, which I would have to say was probably his biggest flaw. But then again, some people still needed to work, so Crawford actually came back to him for a small part in another film down the line. I don't have nearly enough time or energy in this lifetime or the next to talk about all of Castle's films and his gimmicks, so here's a quick look at some of the other notable films and the gimmicks that went along with them. For I Saw What You Did, Castle had the back rows of certain theaters transformed into shock sections. Specialized seatings that had kind of airplane buckles to keep people from being jolted out of their seats in fright. He wanted to do it for every seat in the theater, but the managers basically replied, eh, screw you, we're not paying for that. Well, if you've got Zots, you'll get the point. For the film Zots, which is about a man with a magic coin who could do anything he wished, Castle had his fan club distribute replicas of the same coin from the film. In his memoirs, Castle said this was probably the biggest risk that he would take because his fans probably weren't going to follow his journey into comedy. I don't hate Zots because it's a departure from his regular style. I hate Zots because it's terrible. Now, 13 Frightened Girls was about the daughters of 13 worldwide diplomats living in a boarding house together. There's a plot about espionage and murder and... I don't know, it's honestly kind of confusing. But since the film was going to center around women from multiple countries, Castle promoted each country's star as the main character of the film. So the girl from China would be the top billed woman when it ran in China. The German girl would get the spotlight in the German theaters, and so on and so forth. He even had 13 separate opening narration shots made that were changed out depending on where the movie was played. This is probably the most forward thinking that he did in terms of knowing his audience. Desperately in need of somewhere to live or die. Then we have the very place for you. The only real gimmick for the film The Old Dark House was that it was released the day before Halloween to kind of drum up some holiday pay. But that's only because his original idea didn't work. He wanted to have 20 million keys made up, hand them out to everyone who came to see his movie. And one of those keys would fit into the front door of an actual suspected haunted house. He wanted to give away a haunted house as a gimmick. The only reason this didn't happen was because he didn't have the time before the movie was released to get it all put into action. Because there are a couple of logistical things you have to take into factors here, like what if somebody lost the key and it was the only key that could open the house? At a certain point, even Castle became tired of the B-movie atmosphere. He wanted to direct something of real substance, real A-material. And as a result of his efforts, the world was given Rosemary's Baby. Rosemary's Baby is a hands-down classic. It tells the story of a woman who is conspired against by her husband and her neighbors to give birth to the son of the devil. This is no dream. This is really happening. It is an incredibly tense watch, and the last 20 minutes of this film contain some of the best acting and some of the best dialogue in any movie I have ever seen. What have you done to it? What have you done to its eyes? He has his father's eyes. For the production itself, Castle was really dedicated to get this film made. In an almost eerie callback to his first movie, Castle mortgaged his house again so he could afford the film rights to produce the story. Now, the studio agreed he could stay on as a producer, but after his long career of directing what they felt was below the standards of the studio, they wanted somebody with a stronger, more credible reputation. So they got Roman Polanski. I love Roman Polanski's films sometimes, The Pianist, Chinatown, but just Google Roman Polanski sometimes and remember that they wanted someone more upstanding to direct their film than the guy who made The Old Dark House. Polanski directed the film under his own complete vision. He didn't really take in any input with Castle, especially when it came to showing the devil himself. And whether or not that was for the best, it led to two Academy Award nominations, one of which was a winner. AFIs listed them in five separate lists they've made over the years describing greatness in films. It's even been added to the National Film Registry, which is specifically for films that the Library of Congress has described as culturally, historically, and aesthetically significant films. And do you know how many of those are horror films? 
22. And that includes Young Frankenstein and Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. And you would think that after a hit like this, Castle would be on top of the world, but ask anybody who studies film. The thing about Rosemary's Baby is that many people believe that because of the subject matter, because of the controversy, the film and everyone who worked on it was cursed. The film's composer suffered an accident at a party and he died from his injuries. Roman Polanski's wife, Sharon Tate, was murdered by members of the Manson family. And Castle had his own share of misfortunes following the film's release. He suffered kidney failure just after the film came out. He even fell into a coma due to his illness. He eventually recovered, but by the time he was able to work again, he'd fallen completely out of the spotlight. He only directed one more film, which was called Shanks, and it starred Marcel Marceau. It's one of those examples where just because you can combine weird things doesn't mean you probably should. Castle would produce only a few more films towards the end of his life, including the incredibly campy horror flick Bug, which is about super intelligent cockroaches that can kill people and set cars on fire. Spitting out the fires of hell. I non-ironically recommend it. It's a lot of fun. And as one final stunt to get people to see this movie, Castle took out a million dollar life insurance policy on the film Star. Not the human star, a cockroach named Hercules. It didn't go as well as his past gimmicks did, mostly because the film itself was released the same day as Jaws. That's not a hard decision to make. You won't live alone if you live at all when the bug comes to your house. And unfortunately, this is where the story of William Castle comes to an end. He died of a heart attack in 1977. He'd ironically been working on a script that centered around life after death. And by one report, it would have been his 107th production. More than a few of his friends at the funeral didn't believe it, saying they expected his body to pop out of the casket as one last asinine stunt. Um, I'm not sure if he had lived longer, if he would have capitalized on the success as well, and he would have put on work as good as his earlier stuff, but... I'm an optimist, and I like to think that he had one or two crazy-ass ideas still rattling around in there. One of the books I have on Castle is called Scare Tactic, and it says Castle left behind a legacy in Hollywood. Maybe not as illustrious a career as he would have hoped, but a legacy nonetheless. And I don't know if I agree with that. I think he did perfectly fine. Castle's considered to be the favorite filmmaker of a lot of influential directors. John Waters called him the ultimate showman of Hollywood. Robert Zemeckis called Castle his absolute favorite, and he co-founded a company called Dark Castle Entertainment with the intention of remaking Castle's films. It's made some films I've enjoyed, like Splice and Orphan, but the films that were actual remakes of Castle's, I am not a fan of any of them. And I blame Chris Kattan. And although Castle isn't remembered as one of the great directors or producers in history, he's definitely one of my favorites. He was a unique entity in entertainment. He was a pure, shining beacon of insane ideas and brilliantly executed stunts. He was a great showman. He knew exactly what he was good at in Hollywood, and he exploited the hell out of it. He made horror movie fans out of kids. He made adults terrified. He made spectacles out of films that, without his input, would have just been subpar. And I think that's what I'll remember the most about William Castle's work, how much better he made the movies he was a part of. I love William Castle, and you should read up on him a lot too, because this video doesn't even scratch the surface of the crazy stuff he did. Find out for yourself, and um, do me a favor. Don't spoil it for your friends, because if you do, they'll kill you. If they don't, I will. Thanks for watching this year's 13 Days of Halloween. We'll see you next year.